Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Build Your Copywriting Business Podcast. Hey, Kate. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about the concept of a a work-life balance. And um, quite frankly, I'm going to get very real with you guys and talk about um, a lot of the guilt that I feel. Um, I think we can talk a little bit too probably about... um, one of the presenters, Dorothy, who's a student, presented about uh, spoon theory in our um, our freelancing summit, which was fantastic. And I think it brought up some things for us all to think about. But before I get too ahead of myself, uh, Kate, work-life balance, is it actually even a thing? That's such a good question. I don't, I think it's tricky too when you are building your own copywriting business in particular to have separation of work and life. It takes a lot of intentionality, if that's a word. You have to be very intentional about your your work and life balance. And we always say have a separate room for that you can shut the door, even if that ends up being a closet. Nikki, I know you've worked from a closet before to just... <laughs> Indeed, um, I have that, have that closed door space, um, but those setting those physical boundaries. You know, we've talked about morning routines. I've talked about trying to make a commute in my morning routine just to get out of the house and then come back and be in work mode. It can be very hard to disconnect between work and life, and especially when you're building your business, it can be very hard to relax when you feel like you should be working on your business and building it. And any time that is not spent doing that is time wasted, which is not the case, but it can feel that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, and I, you know, I I have felt that way in the past with my copywriting business. Um, I do feel that way quite transparently now with this business. Um, It's, it's, And I think probably a lot of people, too, that started working from home in 2020 um, discovered just how much that work can creep into any hours, the evening hours, because you're always there right in front of your computer or not, maybe not right in front of your computer, but it's always there. You're you're never too far from where it is that you work when you work from home. Um, And for me, there is that element of, of is what I'm doing useful, which, you know, if I'm sitting and watching Netflix, should I be doing something to, to build the business and should I be, or, you know, whether, or should I be writing copy for clients or I mean, obviously I always hit my deadlines, but should I be writing copy instead of relaxing at the end of the day? Should I be working on this next project for the business instead of, of, you know, watching some dumb show on Netflix or what have you. Um, And for me, it definitely turns into um, an element of of guilt. Like I should be doing something better with my time. I should be doing something more effective, um, which is really not productive. (laughs) Well, and do you find that guilt? Cause I, I feel the same way. I was listening to a podcast with Glennon Doyle and she was talking about watching her wife, Abby sitting on the couch, just relaxing and feeling this rage build in her of like, how can you just be sitting there doing nothing? And I felt that same way with my husband of like, you're relaxing. Why, how can you be relaxing? Look at all the things there are to do. And so I know when I start to feel that guilt, it has the opposite effect though of, of being productive. Like it, it, not only are you not working on your business, you're not effectively using that downtime to actually relax, recharge, have that space and time your brain needs to, to recharge. So do you feel that way with the guilt? Does the guilt start to, just make it worse and compound the problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really, really insightful point because this time when I I actually could be spending time relaxing, you know, like I said, watching TV, reading a book or whatever, letting my brain kind of decompress. Instead, I'm going, well, you should be doing this. And maybe I'm reading a paragraph and then going back to my to-do list or reading a paragraph and going, well, maybe get up and do some laundry or or something like that. Um, Yeah, absolutely. It's what I end up with is, is downtime that was not actually quality downtime. Downtime that was kind of still, (laughs) still half up, Uh, which yeah, it's, it's not very useful. And I would say too, that I, you know, we talk a lot on the, on the podcast and with our students and really on all of our channels about um, figuring out what the best times of the day are for, 
your energy and when you operate best and when you're most creative. And, you know, I know for a fact that I am best first thing in the morning. I mean, we have some big projects and I've actually been getting up at at 3.30 a couple of days each week to use, to have as many of those, which yeah, it's not necessarily healthy, but this is a short period of time thing. Um, But uh, to, so I can have as many of those prime hours as possible. Um, But then at the same time, in the middle of the afternoon, when I still have so many things on my to-do list, and I'm staring at my computer like blank eyed, glassy eyed. Um, and all I can manage to do is like reply to an email from an agency or whatever. Um, I feel guilt about that too, that I'm not able to be constantly performing at a peak level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it gets tricky too when we see a lot of images online of people who are make it look like work-life balance is an easy thing that I am working from the beach and it's very relaxing and I'm able to turn off and I'm able to work three hours a day and be really productive. And I think we get into this myth that that suddenly we're going to achieve that level at a certain income level. We're just going to hit a point where we don't have a struggle between work and life balance. And I think that's a, a, a fallacy and we're always going to have to do work, to make sure we find that right balance. And that, yes, if we we can work from a beach, but to be able to have downtime and maybe go to that beach without our computer, yeah. uh, sand in the keys is not fun. So why not, why not just go and actually take time off versus feeling like you always have to be linked to your computer and it can't be too far away because something might happen. It's, there's always going to be that, that work to do. You know, we've both been doing this for You've been doing it almost double the time I have. And um, still after a decade, I've gotten to a place where work-life balance is, we're getting there, but it's still, there's always something, something new coming in life. Something happens in life. Maybe you start a family and then that work-life balance is wildly different than before you had, uh, you know, started your family. So there's always going to be work to put in. And I want to make sure people know that, that there's no magic moment when all of a sudden it's, it's just there that you have the perfect amount of work and life and there's nothing to be, no work to be done on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think people think about self-care and you know, in terms of get a massage or, or, you know, take a bath with candles and, you know, that kind of, which is, is great and very important. Well, absolutely. Yeah. But um, I think that, that, day-to-day self-care, um, if you don't get a massage every day, which that sounds lovely, um, but that day-to-day self-care is really putting up those boundaries and saying, okay, I I know that I may feel tempted to work more and I may be, I may feel guilty about not working more, but I know that for myself, to keep myself healthy, I need to stop work at five or five thirty or six or whatever your schedule is. Um, that element of of taking care of yourself in a in in the only like a, like a like a bouncer at a club, you know, like nope, yeah. work's not getting in. Nope, um, you know, whatever else it, that that tends to creep into that the downtime, which is very essential. I was listening to a podcast this morning um, and one of the women was talking about self-love and the other one was saying, oh, you know, self-love, I really try to do it. And the other one was like, give yourself a break. If you're at like 80% self-love, you're doing an amazing job. She's, but what she said was, that's pertinent to this, um, was if you can't if you can't feel full self-love for yourself, which quite frankly, most of us can, um, good goal to head toward, but most of us can't, you know, then at least be an advocate for yourself. You know, if you, if you have trouble going, oh, I just love this person with all their imperfections, then at least say, all right, this person is valuable. This person needs to stay, needs to stay uh, at their, their, peak of productivity or needs to stay healthy so that this, this family keeps going, this life keeps going. So being an advocate and saying, okay, well, this person who is yourself needs to sign off at six o'clock. This person needs to have every Sunday morning two events or whatever. Uh, But I thought that was a really interesting concept of being 
an advocate for ourselves and really kind of an advocate for ourselves to ourselves when necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And that might mean you might find that part-time hours are what work for you. And we always talked about, you can make a great salary as a copywriter on part-time hours. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's just what's realistic for you. Or maybe you decide that you can work, you know, part-time sometimes and you ramp it up other times and knowing when those ebbs and flows are for you. If summer gets really busy and wild with, you know, kids being home, ramp down the work and build in that space to do that. The other thing in terms of building in space is we can sometimes want to deliver copy to our clients really, really, really fast. And we want to, you know, oh, I can write this email in a day. Why wouldn't I just give it to them the next day? We never know when you're going to get sick, when you're just going to need an extra couple of hours to run an errand and to help a family member or whatever it may be that comes up in life. Or just to Nikki's point, maybe you're not feeling at the tip top of your game one day. And you stare at that computer and nothing's coming. And so you never know when that might happen, but you can plan for it to happen. If there's anything sure in life is that these moments will happen. So planning in that into your schedule and saying, okay, you know, you get a project from a client, even if it is an email that you feel like you can turn around and say, hey, is next Monday okay? And even if that's a week from when they reached out, that is reasonable. Most clients aren't going to freak out that you need more time and space. Most clients understand that you have other mm-hmm. clients, particularly when you're freelance and you're not full-time. If you're full-time with a company, then yeah, they might want it a little sooner potentially. Uh, but even then, if they're building out their schedule in the right way, uh, nothing is then an emergency that needs to happen overnight. Mm-hmm. So give yourself at least what I call the sleeping room that you get to sleep on it and come back the next day with fresh eyes and look at it for any project. And the bigger the project, give yourself more buffer, more space, and maybe start it earlier so you have something down and you can come back to it later. And that way you're not leaving it to the last minute with your deadlines, but find ways that build time and space into your calendar so that you don't feel that pressure and stress and feel like, well, I need and or I want to log off at, at 5 p.m. and 5 or 5 30 or whatever it is and those are my hours but oh shoot I didn't I need to get this client project done and I need to race to do it so I'm going to be up till 8 p.m. doing it or whatever 9 p.m. midnight I've done it I'm guilty mm-hmm. <laughs> definitely been up late yeah. nights delivering things for clients and that's not the way to deliver your best copy mm-hmm. yeah you have to build in that safety time um you know our our student Dorothy, um, who was on a previous podcast, so we'll link to that as well, um, came in and talked to our students about, our CCA students, um, about managing your energy. She's someone who manages a a chronic illness, um, but she has also managed to build a very successful copywriting business. Um, And uh, in CCA students, the recordings to her her talk are in uh, the course dashboard. So if you have not watched them yet, check them out. Um, but she talks a lot about about that idea of giving yourself that extra time if you have. And I think there was a question of one of the students of how do you how do you figure out how do you figure out that the time frame for a project with the client? And she really talked about that concept of of building in that just in case time, because, um, as she talked about with the, with the spoon theory, you, which we won't get into too much here, but the, um, cause we're not the experts in it, but, um, you only have so much time, uh, excuse me. You only have so much energy per day. You only have so much and you're not going to eat as much as we would like to believe that caffeine will give us more energy or whatever will give us more energy. There's only so much we have each day. And if, in, you know, she was talking about this in terms of managing chronic illness. Um, the idea is you only have, it's a metaphor. You only have so many spoons in a drawer available to, or at least I add in the drawer, but there's only so many spoons in a drawer available to you. And if you spend, you know, If you've got five spoons and you spend four spoons doing a big client project in the morning and you have another big client project in the afternoon, you just don't have the spoons slash energy left to dedicate to it. And so you have to go into it. Like you were saying, Kate, building out, building out time just in case, because if you put yourself, 
if you put, it can be very tempting to put deadline after deadline after deadline and keep them really tight and be like, no, this would be great. I'm just going to get the work in and churn it out and boom, boom, boom. But that's not how we as, as creatives operate. We need that time. We need that downtime to step away, go for a walk and let our brain process that. The best way to write copy is to do a draft, get up and walk away and let your brain think about it while you're not actively thinking about it. Let your brain process it so that when you come back, even if you're not ready for the editing stage, even if you're still writing, you'll be able to put together more in insightful, more effective copy. Yeah, I almost never work on one project from start to finish without other projects in between as well. So if you're the type of person that thinks, well, how do I maintain a, the income levels that I want if I'm not if I'm building in that much time, well, because you have other projects that are on different timelines in between there. So you might start working on one and then you work on another that's completely different. You know, maybe you have an email for one client and you have a web page for another client. And that for me really helps to say, okay, I'm going to devote this much time to this project. Okay. Now I'm going to focus on this client and have different times of day for the different projects that are going on and learn to manage those throughout the course of the timeline that I've given my clients to deliver. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about this, but I'm going to say it again. And I know Nikki, you'll reiterate it again too. This concept of a VIP day or a day rate of having a client buy you for a day, buy your time and say, here's what I'm going to deliver in a day. Yes, I could and have done that. It is not the best use of your energy and it is not the best for your clients. I can churn out some real good copies straight through. Yes, it is so much better for my clients and it is so much better for me when there is more time and space in that project. You need that marination time. That is a real thing. And people think, I think there's guilt around that of like, well, I just took a walk, but I was thinking about this this whole time. Yes. <laughs> and that's actually great mm -hmm. that you're doing that because that is so important to have that time to let ideas sink in, to sleep on ideas, to have that, you know, it's not going to come out of nowhere, you know, that idea of like the idea is just going to strike. But there is something to it in that if you give yourself more time and space and look away and look at different things that more ideas will come to you, you have more information, you're not just stuck looking at a screen and trying to figure something out and plow through a project. So if you're considering the idea of a, a VIP day, a day rate, I would strongly suggest you don't. Um, I think the idea behind it is that, oh, I can make a ton of lump, lump sum of money in one day. Um, you can make that same amount across many days and have many clients and come out to the same income level without driving yourself crazy and delivering far, far, far better work for your clients. No one needs anything delivered in the same day. Mm -hmm. They just do not. <laughs> yes. I strongly, strongly second that. VIP days or this like book me for a day are a gimmick, but they're not good for you as a creative and they're not good for your client. You're not delivering the best work that you could be delivering. To Kate's point, if, if, you, if you have eight hours and you're like powering through in one day, first of all, how stressful is that? Why would you want to do that? Like, yes, you get a big paycheck. But to Kate's point, I could take those eight hours and spread them out over the course of a week. No client, like you said, Kate, no client needs end of day copy. If you're, you're talking with the client, they you, there's a very good chance that a week from now is perfectly reasonable for them to get your copy. So instead of doing eight hours at once, spreading that out and eight hours across a couple of different days, you're still getting the same paycheck at the end of the day and you're still doing the same work, except your client's actually getting better work and you're not driving yourself crazy, which gets back to that whole idea of what is really best for you, what is really you know, if you, you could do a VIP day, right? Like, okay. But if you can only handle doing one VIP day, let's even say a week, I would say that's probably even too much because one VIP day, you're going to burn yourself out for at least a day or two afterwards. So that's, let's say maybe you can work effectively like that, but you're cutting into your regular you're cutting into your other work time. So it's not like, oh, these VIP days are going to add on to my regular schedule. No, because you're under your client's eye for eight hours when we're normally working at home where we can work a little bit, we get up, we get some lunch. We, but when you are doing a VIP day with your client, you are there with them all day long and you must be delivering. 
And I don't know any copywriter, sorry for the snapping into the, the microphone. Um, <laughs> whoops. Um, I don't know any copywriter who does better work when they're watched than when they're not watched. It's just not how it works. On, yeah. When you're on a timeline, you're on a tight timeline. I, I work well under pressure, but that's like next level and unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, and it, it seems like it's, it's a flashy idea, right? But it's, it's a gimmick. And it, and it comes back to the idea of what do, what do we really need, you know, guilt or not. And I'm going to work on giving up that guilt. That is my, my, plan for for the rest of the year my big my big uh goal personal goal um but really being true to what do I need not what's a gimmick not what's flashy not what seems like we may get a bunch of cash right away but what well and then uh, what project have you been on that you kick it off and there aren't more questions there's not more potential other conversations with other stakeholders there's not additional things that you dig into where you're like ooh, this is actually we need to we need to re-strategize this. It, it becomes an execution day of, I want this, 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 and this. And then you're not being that strategic partner that we always talk about being that is helpful to your clients to actually be a partner and, and talk through what might be the best solution. It doesn't give space for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely true. If you, you know, oh, well, we, when your client says, oh, I guess we don't right have to look into that. We don't really have an answer to that question. That could be a very important question. There's no time for that. You have to execute on what they gave you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a good idea. You're not advocating for yourself. You're not advocating for your client. Um, you have to, uh, I forget where we were talking about this, probably everywhere, but the idea that you, when you are a freelancer, when you are, or, you know, even if you're on staff, you are your business's asset. If anything happens to you, you're in big flipping trouble. You know, if you let yourself get ground down into the ground, ground down into the ground, you know what I'm saying? If you let yourself get ground down by too much work, if you push yourself, push yourself, push yourself to the point when you get burned out. And, um, I can tell you, I think probably a lot of people listening have experienced that, but as someone who definitely has, it's, it's not, it's not even in your hands anymore, whether you want to work, you can't do it. You are absolutely incapable of doing it. And that is a very scary place to be when you are the person who is the person who is bringing in that income, you know, it, it, same thing. If you work a full-time job, you know, if you push, 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 you get to the point where you're burned out and you can't go into work, you know, one mental health day, it, they might give that to you, but at a certain point they're going to be like, yeah, you need to show up or else this job isn't going to be there for you. And it's the same thing with freelance. I mean, you don't have the option to be like, Oh, I'm just not going to turn in this project. Hmm. I'm just not going to pitch for new clients who needs income. You can't let yourself get so ground down that you are incapable of, of doing that work. So, and I, as I say this out loud, it's imagine me also saying this to myself, everyone, we all learn and grow. Nobody's perfect, (laughs) but there is that matter of, I, yes, I may feel guilt that I'm not working in the evenings, but and by that same token, if I don't take that time off in the evening, if I don't take time off on the weekends, I'm going to push myself so hard that I will hit burnout. I know it. And I will be incapable of doing anything. And my copywriting business needs me too much for that. This business needs me too much for that. And, uh, it's, it's getting into the danger zone. So overcoming that guilt with the fact that this is absolutely a necessity to, to protect my hours and protect my boundaries. Yeah. So I want to go back. You mentioned being your goal to work on your guilt. What are some of the ways that you are going to try to work on that guilt? Do you Mm. have any, do you have any tips for working lowering at least the guilt. Cause I think it's never going to go away completely right away, but mm-hmm. how to, how to lower 
I'm asking for myself, but also for listeners. Well, well mostly for myself. Yes. Um, I, I heard something. I do a lot of learning on podcasts. I listen to a ton of them. Um, and I heard something that someone was talking about the concept of, of white space. And I think it was, um, in fact, I think the book might be called White Space. We'll have to look it up. Um, but this idea of, of your brain needing some time where it's not doing anything, where you're not watching TV, where you're not reading a book, where you're just, even if it's like 10 minutes staring out a window, um, they found that, and actually even getting to the point of boredom is very good for your creativity and very good to recharge you. Um, and along the same lines, she also said it, she's found that it's very beneficial for people to have rituals, um, rituals to get you into your day and rituals to get you out of your day. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm okay with getting into the day. You know, it's you shower, you get dressed, you do makeup, do your hair, make a cup of coffee, sit down, open up. That feels very ritualistic for me. But at the end of the day, there's very much, um, a little bit of a creep, like where I finished this project and then I, you know, maybe I've started doing stuff over here and I started, but I still have my phone with me. So I'm still responding to Slack notifications or, so I think for me, I think making a deliberate ritual to sign off in the evenings at whatever point that is, you know, I'll scale back gently. I'm not going to be like, all right, 530 done, nothing, no responses. But, you know, maybe like seven is a reasonable time to fully scale off. Um, and I'm not saying that it's what you should do, Kate. You should, as a member of the team, you should do whatever's best for you. Um, but I, I think I do want to explore that concept of, of a ritual to um, a ritual to end the day. And then also truly spending, even if it's like five, ten, five, ten minutes, just in that that white space, that doing nothing. I really want to explore what that could do for, for decompressing and, and, you know, eventually creativity. Yeah. I love that. I actually staring out a window. I did that yesterday. I flopped on my bed and I just looked out the window. I'm like, this is so nice. And it wasn't long. It felt really long, but it wasn't long and it wasn't scrolling on my phone mindlessly, which I think me, I'm sure I'm not alone. That feels like a great way to decompress. Let me look at some fun Instagram things. That actually doesn't help me. And I know that. I know that. Mm -hmm. But breaking that habit, I think, is is a real important one. I love that idea. Yeah. The evening, evening ritual. It's a great point being very careful about what our quote unquote recharge activities are and verify whether they not whether or not they actually recharge you. Um I had plans three days this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I was booked all three days and going into it. I was like, Oh God, this is going to be rough. I'm just fun stuff, but I'm not used to being that scheduled. Um, and the funny thing was on Monday morning, a friend texted me and said, Hey, how's your, how's your day going? You know, how, how you feeling? Um, and I went, Oh, I actually feel very focused and I very productive. And I think it was because they were actually fun activities that I enjoyed. And it wasn't all day, you know, I, I still do a little, little bit of downtime, but I think because they were fun activities with people that I liked, um, no mass activities, of course, but um, it was, it was recharging in a way that sitting and watching a day worth of TV or a couple of days worth of TV never is. I always think it's going to be, and it never, ever is. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to end this episode with basically me having a lot of work to do. <laughs> Kate's got some work to do too. Um, Cause he's a bit, yeah. A little bit of disconnect. A little bit disconnect. Of, exactly. Disconnecting, uh, self care, advocating for ourselves. Um, and, and really, yeah. Putting ourselves, making ourselves the priority because we have to in our businesses. Um, so yes, that is my commitment to myself, you know, also to you guys, but to myself to work on this. Um, and I know for a fact that there are a lot of people listening and a lot of people watching that are, are doing the same thing. So I would, we would, uh, gently encourage you to try this experiment with us and, uh, let us know how it goes. And if you come up with any new tips or techniques or, or, or mindsets that really help you, um, I've heard them say it's not work-life balance. It's, it's just 
a whole mix of things, but a mix of things in a good, healthy way, not a mix of things where it's all just one thing. Um, but if you guys come up with, with new techniques, tips, mindsets, ways of thinking about things, we are certainly, yeah, bring it on. We're certainly uh, open to hearing about it. Um, so we hope that this has been helpful. Uh, I know my friend has been helpful for me and it's given me a little bit of homework, which yes, I need to do. So going to do it, I promise. So we've got some work to do. We promise we are going to do it. Commitment. Uh, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Bye everybody. Thanks for watching. Make sure you don't miss any tips, tools, or tactics for copywriters by clicking subscribe right now. And of course, you can always find us over at filthyrichwriter.com. We'll see you next time.